you understand the definition of Pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. it is something that is so fundamentally sound mm -hmm. that you connect throughout the diaspora. Yes. And you support and you build. Mm -hmm. Why is it not more sustained and more prevalent? That's an excellent question. It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. The Minister of Wellness Ministries and Rock Newman Show 2.0 present free community health fair and seminar Saturday, March 18th, 2023 at Union Temple Baptist Church, Washington, D.C. Or as VP before we reach capacity, DMV Health Fair dot eventbrite.com or click the link in the description box. If you can't make it in person, no worries. You can purchase the live stream link by visiting theministerofwellness.com under healing services or once again, just click that link in the description box. Calling all potential vendors, sponsors, or volunteers, please submit a contact form via theministerofwellness.com or call 888-847-8026. That's 888-847-8026. It's high time for a health revolution. What's very important of paramount importance is we never make a distinction between the fighters and their organizations. For too long, we separate fighters from the organizations. We separate Dr. King from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Yeah. We separate the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan from the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. We separate Malcolm X from the Nation of Islam, Organization of African Unity, mm -hmm. Muslim Mosque Incorporated. We separate Kwame Ture Ma from the All-African Mandela, Mandela from Mandela from the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. So I think that understanding that defending Zimbabwe's integrity, defending Zimbabwe's sovereignty is the ultimate goal and also remembering that the United States and European Union, US EU imperialism's goal is to bring about regime change. So they did not just want f former President Mugabe gone, they want the Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front gone because of what they represent in the scheme of Southern Africa being the most stable region in Africa at this particular historical juncture. Um, when you take a look at the fact that the Obama administration on the heels of the Bush administration introduced U.S. Africa Military Command, which is an initiative set up to intensify their military presence on the African continent. And you look at that throughout, throughout the African continent. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, the main satellite is in Stargard, Germany, but on the continent of Africa in Djibouti, in East Africa, which we geographically call the Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. that's where the main satellite is. But when you look at it from the vantage point that when we were babies in struggle, shutting down the United States over the Rodney King verdict and police terrorism in this, inside the borders of this country and letting it be emphatically known that our struggle against um, police terrorism in this country is inextricably linked to the struggle to end military repression and violence everywhere in the world. We've had revolutionaries of the highest order who have had a military background, but the question is not letting your former colonizers and captors dictate your direction militarily. And remember, 18 years ago, 19 years ago, before the land reclamation program, President, former President Mugabe oversaw the Southern African Defense Forces for the whole region, mm -hmm. and they w made a decision that Zimbabwe's military, Angola's military, and Namibia's military would fight off um, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and former National Security Advisors Susan Rice's pet project to reinvade the Congo mm -hmm. after Mobutu, the godfather of military neocolonialism, mm -hmm. showed the door. Mm -hmm. You know what? You're doing something as you <laughs> as you um, talk about the various names of the countries on the continent of Africa, uh -huh. because much too much, too many people say Africa and think that's it. Yes. And there are uh -huh. 54 countries in Africa. Yes. You teach at the Sankofa Homeschool Community. There, and, amongst many other places. Yes, <laughs> and part of what comes out of that teaching mm -hmm. is your identifying 
the uniqueness of Africa. Yes, that 8,000 students drop out every day in the United States of America, and so-called African Americans have the distinction of, if you want to call it that, of being 850 of that 8,000, which is 350,000 um, students a year. So we understand what's coming down the pipe, so we want to have some alternatives in place. So we are tied to the Liberated Minds Homeschool Expo in Atlanta, Georgia, the Black, School, Black Star Homeschool Academy in Birmingham, Alabama, we have ties to um, some folks in Antigua and London, so it's a growing movement. But I also teach at Muhammad University of Islam. Mm -hmm. I've also taught at Ujima Shule. I've also taught at the Academy for Ideal Education. I've also taught at Ideal Public Charter School here in the district. Twice a year, if schedule permits, but at least once a year, we go to Alabama, where we go into Marion, mm -hmm. to um, Lowndes County, to Montgomery, and now to Birmingham, primarily in Marion, that's very that's historically significant yeah. because at one time the infamous Lincoln Normal um, University HBCU had the distinction of having more um, PhDs per capita than any other HBCU in the country. And at one point, instructors from Tuskegee, from Miles, from Alabama A and M and Alabama State would convene at Lincoln Normal every summer. Mm -hmm. Eventually, what ends up happening is we're usually at the schools once a week that we have the privilege of going to. And then what ends up happening is the parents um, are looking for us all the time. And then um, it piques their curiosity, and it is from that vehicle that we've been able to funnel the kids into Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company, where we use history, theater as a vehicle to teach history. And as you eloquently put it, yeah, it's so simple. Um, this is the decolonization process, which is never going to stop. We just want to make sure that we're forward thinking to ensure victory in the decolonization process. And I, I recently read something, uh, certainly one of the giants to come, to come out of the halls of Howard University, Stokely Carmichael at the time, mm -hmm. Kwame Toure. Mm -hmm. um, there is an initiative uh, underfoot um, uh, that involves and, and, and invokes his memory. Can you share with what, of course. what that is? Um, his son, um, Buka Toure, um, has creating, uh, this year makes, is the 20th anniversary of Kwame passing, um, actually next week, November 15th. He succumbed from prostate cancer at the tender age of 57 in Conakry, Guinea, where he was the head advisor of the Democratic Party of Guinea. Most people, when they speak of him, they speak of him in the context of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating mm -hmm. Committee, understandably so. Mm -hmm. Some may speak of him um, as one of the founders of the first Black Panther Party in Lowndes County. Mm -hmm. Some may speak of him in relationship to the third Black Panther Party, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, when he was the honorary prime minister, mm -hmm. responsible for 45 chapters in a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Some glowingly got to know him during his time with the All-African People's Revolutionary Party as this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare by Osage for Kwame Nkrumah, mm. where, which Kwame bragged he got to see in manuscript form. Mm. And that is where we first heard of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. Mm. And so people know about him, but people forget that Kwame became the head advisor of the Democratic Party of Guinea, founded by Akme Sekou Toure, which is the first political party um, created during the anti-colonial resistance in Africa. We had unions, we had fronts, we had movements, but the standout parties, you had the um, Democratic Party of Guinea in 1946, when Osage for Kwame Nkrumah got back to Ghana, he comes with the Convention People's Party, 49. Around 56, we have the Party for Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde and Emil, with Emil Cabral. Mm -hmm. And then you have in um, Zambia, you have the um, United National um, Independent Party. Mm -hmm. And Fela Kuti's mo mother had the People's Communist Party in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's important, and we've been saying, nudging, uh, pressuring with love, our sisters and brothers that make up our civil and human rights fraternity, Pan-Africanize your voting education initiatives. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by that is when we come to talk about parties, we should be talking about the parties we created in Africa. Mm -hmm. We should be talking about the first party in the um, hemisphere in 1908, 
Partido Independiente de Colo created in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about alternatives to the two-headed monster, the Democratic and Republican Party, mm -hmm. and we're not going to talk about the parties that come out of our resistance, that come out of our, that have the ingredients of self-determination mm -hmm. and national liberation. We're doing the children a disservice. Mm -hmm. So just that, but yes, the initiative to introduce an exhibit that commemorates the work contributions, the service and sacrifice of Kwame Ture. It is scheduled to be launched in Conakry, Guinea, where he is buried next to Ahmed Sekou Ture yeah. and Mbalia Kamara. But um, the first showing of the exhibit will be sometime in February at Howard University. And we thank you for your support with this initiative. Political, social, economic philosophy rooted mm. in Kwame Ture. Yes. As he answered the phone, kind of almost on his dying bed, mm -hmm. was still ready for the revolution. Mm -hmm. And he was a- which, which comes from the Democratic Party of Guinea. Many yeah. people don't know yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And, and so Pan-Africanism yeah. was, was in his DNA oh, until, his, until his last day. Yes. Which if you understand the definition of Pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. it is something that is so fundamentally sound Mm -hmm. that you connect throughout the diaspora yes, and you support and you build. Mm -hmm. Why is it not more sustained and more prevalent? That's an excellent question. I think what it is is it could come down to approach. If I could have a departure, because you, you got to speaking about Spanish-speaking Africans, so you have me over here. There's a quick poem we have, can I do it? Yes. Okay, and this is called the language poem and this deals with this whole question of Africans in the Americas for those of us who firmly believe that the first form of public transportation was the slave ships. So this is the language poem. Um, Africans here in the U.S. are English-speaking Africans. Africans in Trinidad are English-speaking Africans. Africans in Jamaica are English-speaking Africans. Just like Africans who live in Ghana, just like Africans who live in Kenya, just like Africans who live in Zimbabwe. English-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Haiti are French-speaking Africans. Africans in Martinique are French-speaking Africans. Just like Africans who live in Guinea, just like Africans who live in Algeria, just like Africans who live in the Congo. French-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Cuba are Spanish-speaking Africans. Africans in Colombia are Spanish-speaking Africans. Africans in Venezuela are Spanish-speaking Africans, just like Africans who live in Equatorial Guinea. Spanish-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Brazil are Portuguese-speaking Africans, just like Africans who live in Angola, just like Africans who live in Mozambique, just like Africans who live in Guinea-Bissau. Portuguese-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. We're all Africans, we're all Africans, we're all Africans. Learn to explain it, learn to celebrate it, learn to defend it. So that's one of the poems we came up with for children to deal with that dynamic you spoke of earlier. And if, the part of what we dealt with, again, was the profound effort in these, in these various countries yes. to distance themselves. And again, you know, colonialism, the propaganda machine and mm -hmm. the rest. Whites and white, 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 it, that show illuminated what has been the effectiveness of white supremacy. Of course. And I'm glad you brought that up because let's, let's just do it this way. First of all, um, as Kwame Ture trained us and taught us, as Mukasa Dada trained us and taught us, um, Pan-Africanism is not an ideology, it's an objective. And the reason that we say that is because they are things that can be dangerous that are counter-revolutionary, that reek of neo-colonialism, but have a Pan-African makeup and character to it. An initiative in 1983 after Reagan spoke to European Parliament about the need for them to have think tanks to ensure victory in the Cold War. And um, the observers that were chosen of African makeup, you had Johnny Carson, the former um, Assistant Secretary for African Affairs under the first Obama administration, mm -hmm. U.S. Ambassador to Zimbabwe under the second Clinton administration, he's part of the delegation. Karen Bass, the highest ranking African in the Congress of um, International Relations Committee, was on the delegation. Connie Barry Newman, who was Assistant Secretary for African Affairs to George Bush, the father, was part of the delegation. And uh, the former president of uh, 
Liberia, Ellen Johnson Salif was part of the delegation, and the former interim president of the Central African Republic, Catherine Samba Panza, was part of the delegation. That delegation is Pan-African in makeup. Mm -hmm. Certainly nothing we would promote. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the makeup of that delegation is to make sure that those of us who, de who defend what we defend are buried six feet under. So all manifestations, all expressions of Pan-Africanism are not revolutionary, mm -hmm. are not committed to self-determination. As a matter of fact, some are created to compromise everything that we have shed our blood for. Obi, for, for, for the uninformed, what, what I'd really like for you to do is in, a, in the most fundamental way, deal with this issue of land. Because the, again, the imagery is mm -hmm. black savages are taking away the land that belongs to yeah. white farmers and, and we can't let them have it because they don't know how to farm it anyhow. I do one better than that. Twin, uh, 17 years ago, I'm working at uh, Bowie State University. I'm not smart enough to teach college. I was working in dorms. Mm -hmm. And a uh, professor comes up to me, uh, Fred Mills, Caucasian, progressive, does a lot of work around El Salvador, does a lot of work around Cuba, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. That's his focus. Mm -hmm. So he sees me in the hallway, and at that time, we had gotten Bowie State University to commit to become the first HBCU to develop a cultural exchange program with Cuba. Because once they read the Chronicle of Higher Education and saw Duke was going to do it, Tulane was going to do it, Berkeley was yeah. going to do it, Harvard was mm -hmm. going to do it, it was fine with them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, getting back to the point, so he sees me in the hallway, he runs me down, he's like, ah, Brother Igbuna. I said, yeah, what's, what can I do for you? He says, uh, what do you think about the land seizure in Zimbabwe? Every question you answer is based on orientation and outlook, correct? Sure. Right. So I said, oh, what makes you bring up Cecil Rhodes and the British South African Company? What makes you bring up Jeffrey Huggins? What makes you bring up Ian Smith? Oh, I wasn't talking about them. I said, what you talking about then? He said, no, I was talking about the government taking, I said, you used the word seized. How can pres former President Mugabe and ZANU-PF seize Zimbabwean land from British and Rhodesian byproducts who were there because of what the British South African company did with their fascist slogan from Cape to Cairo, meaning they wanted every grain and every inch of Africa. Palestinians can't seize Palestine. Our Native American sisters and brothers can't seize La Plato, the Chippewa Nation from the Democrats and Republicans is theirs. Evo Morales in Bolivia did not seize Bolivia, he reclaimed it. The Irish, as the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey told us, Africa for the Africans, Ireland from the Irish, they're not seizing Belfast, they're seeking to reclaim it. All indigenous people are obligated by history to re reclaim what is inherently theirs. So any conversation about that is obviously to divert attention from the question of land. And ironically, we shouldn't be surprised that this is going to happen with what is called South Africa, because we're 17 years removed from the United Nations Conference on Racism, Xenophobia, and other related intolerances, where the Bush administration had many sleepless nights because they didn't want chattel slavery, our captivity, reparations and Palestine to be conversations. And ironically, that's the same numerical year that they introduced the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act, which was sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe for reclaiming 70% of the country's most agriculturally resourceful land from 4,500 commercial farmers of European, British, Rhodesian ancestry. So we reclaim what is ours, never seizure. The only question is, when we reclaim it, will we do right by the people and make sure that they're the beneficiaries of it? Okay, so right now, there is an emerging Chinese presence mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. When I was in Libya, I saw it. Mm -hmm. Proliferation mm -hmm. of, 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 of buildings. Mm -hmm. So it's the, 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 the Chinese impact mm -hmm. is spreading. Mm -hmm. So, the, with the indigenous people, mm -hmm. China pouring in money, what's China's objective? Okay. And what's going to be the defense against China doing what imperialists have done before? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, um, the thing that's interesting about that, and I won't, like I said, we're not naming names today, but of course, you know, we get this uh, question all the time. Uh, but interestingly enough, those who have gone on record using um, newspapers at their disposal, shows like this at their disposal, whatever um, platform they have at their disposal that have raised the question of the Chinese presence in Africa, 
Um, interestingly enough, if you go back and look at them in, based on their organizational track record mm -hmm. as individuals, that's, let's assume they're even organizing, because you know many people don't even organize no more, Mr. Newman, but that's a whole another conversation for another day. But many of them have never talked about the African Growth and Opportunity Act of the Clinton administration. Many of them have never talked about the corporate okay, council. Okay, stop there. Okay. Stop there. What's the name of it? The African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. And I think that you bring that up mm -hmm. as in you got some issues with it. Of course. And what is what what and what are those issues? Because as our sisters, um, you know, and other women spent um last year, um for, and this year focusing on Harvey Weinstein, for example, we say don't forget Harvey Weinstein, uh, Harvey Firestone, mm -hmm. because if Mother Africa could cry me too and talk about rape and talk about plunder, obviously what Firestone has done, obviously what all of the businesses that are part of the Council of Foreign Relations have done, obviously what the Anglo-American Corporation has done, obviously what De Beers has done, obviously what Shell has done, Africa could scream rape at the top of her lungs. We got a poem about that one. We won't do it right now, though, called Don't Touch, Don't Touch. So that whole question. So when we talk about the African Growth and Opportunity Act, oh, and we just, we, let's just take it back to Nkrumah. Nkrumah talks about um, when he came here in 1960, um, as we know, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, his passport was seized by the United States government at the tender age of 83 mm -hmm. from uh, 1953 uh, to 1961. So obviously, who, who, knew, who knew Nkrumah better than King, who went to Ghana's independence celebration, mm -hmm. better than Ralph Bunch, who went there, better than John Johnson, who went there. He couldn't even go. He would have led the delegation. Right. So he bumps into him and Nkrumah. They see each other while they're here. And, and Nkrumah tells him, yeah, I came here to talk about the, um, the dam we were building, the Akasambo, the first hydroelectrical dam built in modern African history. Mm -hmm. He said, but the moment I touch down here, the Hershey people want to see me about mm -hmm. the cocoa in Ghana. Mm -hmm. We, um, those who remember the Lancaster House negotiations in Zimbabwe, remember that Jesse Helms went to London, intercepted Bishop Abel Muzariwa, the reactionary um, religious leader, if you want to call him that. They bring him back here to D.C., put him in a room with our R.J. Reynolds leadership, the tobacco company, mm -hmm. put him in the room with uh, Philip Morris, mm -hmm. and they say, if you give us control of the agriculture industry, we'll push you in front of Mugabe and Nkomo. This is fact. Mm -hmm. So we already know that um, people who are talking about China, the mistake that people are making is they're starting the relationship between China and Africa uh, on the business context. Um, China built the railroads for Tanzania under the leadership of Walimu Julius Nyerere. Mm -hmm. When you saw President Mugabe, I believe he had on the Peking suit. Mm -hmm. The reason was because China gave Zimbabwe, ZANU-PF, guns. Russia gave ZAPU and Como's group guns. And the Chinese, the, the Russians used to teach you when they gave you guerrilla training, the outcome of a guerrilla war was determined by the quality of armament. The Chinese said, no, it's the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And when Josiah Tongo Gara, who led the armed struggle in Zimbabwe, when they went to the Nanking Academy, President Monongagwa, the current president, also being part of that group that went, mm -hmm. the Chinese told them, never carry weapons amongst the people. You will scare them. They will call the colonial authorities on you. Only use your weapons when you're going to strike the enemy. Mm -hmm. And that should be done very calculated. So, so is it, is it mm -hmm. your studied opinion mm -hmm. at this time that what the Chinese are doing is helpful? 